Alhamdulillah, uh, we commence by praising Almighty Allah and we send salutations and prayers upon the seal of all prophets from Adam all the way to the last prophet Muhammad, peace of Almighty forever be upon them all. Uh, you know, they gave me a chair to sit and, you know, Bruce Lee cannot perform while he's sitting. So I prefer to stand up if you don't mind. It's okay to stand up? It's fine for me to stand up? Okay. And I apologize, y'all just lost the game. And I guess y'all can give us kudo, you know, for winning the Super Bowl in Philly. <laughs> All right, give us kudo on that one. All right, good. Thank you very much. Um, being here today, I'm actually elated to be before you tonight. The brothers invited. They asked me to come here today to talk about the true reflection of Islam through the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the prophets and messengers before. So coming here tonight, as they ask me to present this message or proposition tonight, I would like to make something clear. They said we come in to talk to our respected non-Muslim guests here. But some of the things that I will be sharing with you tonight, I can guarantee you even some Muslims are not even aware of some of the information that we will share with you tonight, and it's all about the same man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I encourage the Muslims and our respected non-Muslim guests here, when I speak, sometimes I will go a little bit faster, maybe like Ferrari, in case I go faster, please pardon me and forgive me. You know, coming from Philly, we can go slow. We have to make sure we keep the flow. See? So our topic tonight, true reflection of Al-Islam, talking about the legacy. As you can see through Al-Hirz Institute, preserving the legacy. That's the legacy of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And now when we say Muhammad, we're not talking about a man sent to Muslims as people believe that his message was only for Muslims. No, he wasn't sent to Muslims. Sometimes, you know, we say Muslims. No, Muslims, not Muslims. He wasn't sent to Muslims. He was sent to the world as the scripture teaches us. Now in the Old Testament, we are aware that Moses was sent to his own people. And in the New Testament, in the, mo in the book according to Mark, the gospel according to Mark, Jesus Christ himself said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So all the prophets and all the messengers were sent specifically to their own people. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, being the last and the final, he was sent to the world. Not only Muslims. So just like Muslims must know who that man was, the same thing now Muslims, it's also your responsibility to know who that man was. Because when he arrived with his legacy, he did not target Muslims. And it's enough for us to understand that at that time, there wasn't even Muslims on the planet, right or wrong. I asked the Muslims here, when he came with his message, was there any Muslims on the planet at that time? No. So he did not come to target Muslims. He did not come to talk to Muslims, and now Muslims are not part of his message, never. His message was meant for the world. And tonight I will share with you some verses from Quran. And as I'm talking, you can write. You can take notes. If you have pen and paper, you can write. 
If you have Steve Jobs device, you can record. Bill Gates, you can record. Whatever you get, as long as it's from whatever you can retain this information, just record. And before you exit, you can ask whatever you want. Whatever you want, we have Google right here. Right? OK. Whatever you want, you can ask. So please, feel free. We did not come to take your hostage here tonight. We did not come to disturb or bother you. We came to share with you the same legacy that he left. Now when we ask, who was that man Muhammad? Peace be upon him. Always when we say Muhammad or when we mention Jesus Christ or when we, when we mention, you know, Isaiah or Isaac or when we mention Jacob, all the prophets, when we mention them, is out of respect, including prophet Jesus himself, to pray and ask Almighty to send his salutations upon them. So it's, it's like a disrespect for a man to name Jesus without praying upon Jesus Christ. As a Muslim, we can't do that. So just like we say, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when we call Jesus, we also we say the same thing, peace be upon him. So from time to time, I will say it in Arabic, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam means, may the peace of Almighty be upon him. And sometimes I will just say it in English. Muhammad, peace be upon him. Who knows his full name? His full name. See? Okay, Muslims, the full name of Prophet. Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. Uh huh. We keep going. Abul Qasim al Qurash al Hashimi. That's it. Ibn Abdul Manaf. See, you're chopping the name. Somebody's giving me mashed potatoes and somebody's dropping, you know, hot sauce on it. <laughs> you're chopping the name. Okay? Is there any? Y'all can Google it. It's free of charge to Google here in San Diego, right? He was Muhammad, son of Abdullah. Abdullah was the son of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib was the son of Hashim. Hashim was the son of Abdi Manaf. Abdi Manaf was the son of Qusay. Qusay was the son of Kilab. Kilab was the son of Murra. Murra was the son of Lu'ay. Lu'ay was the son of Fihr. Fihr was the son of Lu'ay, also the top. All the way to Mu'ad, Nizar, Ilyas, Ibn Mudar, Ibn Mu'ad, Ibn Adnan. That was the full name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had in this name, the names that you heard, at least 15 grandfathers. All of them. Not even one. That was among those who embrace Islam. All of them died before this man even became a prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name we just mentioned. He was born where? Where was he born? Mecca. In Mecca. Did he stay there? No. no. Do you know why? This is our presentation tonight. This is what we will be talking about tonight. He was born in Mecca, but he did not stay in Mecca. Why? Because when he started preaching about this faith system, his own people, they denied. They said, no, we don't believe in what you're saying. So you have to get out and go somewhere else. But what happened is that at the end, all of them came back. They said, we need Muhammad back in our own city. Because when he left the legacy that he left in Mecca, they said, no, the light is gone. We need him back. We need him to come back because he took the light with him. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, was from a tribe called Hashim. And Hashim at the time was the best tribe. They considered Hashim or the tribe of Bani Hashim as the best what? tribe. 
So he's from this tribe. That's why they call him Hashimi. And that's why the brother back there, he said when we ask about his name, he said he was Hashimi. That means he's from that tribe. Now when he came, he spent 35 years. He never claimed prophethood. He never asked people to follow him. He never claimed to be a prophet. He never claimed to be God's messenger. He never claimed to be God's prophet. For 35 years, he lived in Mecca. And for your information, he, le he never lived, he never traveled outside Mecca. The only place that he traveled to is from Mecca to Medina, that's it. Around Arabian Peninsula, he did not go out. So in case some books that you may read that he traveled to Yemen, he traveled to Damascus, no, he did not. He remained in Mecca, from Mecca to Medina, or if that was the neighborhood that he preached in. Peace be upon him. So this man, when he came, after 35 years, he spent 35 years in Mecca. He did not ask them to follow him. He did not say, I'm God's prophet. He did not say, I was sent to you. Until he turned, what? 40. That's when he asked Almighty God to open his, what? His chest. Because some things that the people in Mecca were doing to him was wrong. Naturally, he wasn't able to digest some things that they did. A strong man will eat the feeble. If you're strong, you get like extra muscles. Let's say you get Tyson right here, he will eat me up. Maybe Schwarzenegger, he will eat me up. Why? Because he's stronger. And if you do not have a family member from Mecca, where he was born, nobody will support you and nobody will what? Help you if you need help. So corruption was right there in Mecca when he was growing up. So he used to isolate himself to a cave known as the cave of Hira. In Arabic, it's called Gharu Hira. What's the name of the cave again? The cave of Hira. In Arabic, that's Gharu Hira. Ghar in Arabic means a cave. So he used to isolate himself, forsaking his own people, all the way to the cave of Hira. Why? He used to do this purposely to gain closeness with God and to be closer to Almighty God. Praying. So he was in that cave. When someone came, he was in that cave when someone came. And the one who came to him wasn't a human being. That was angel, known as Jibreel, angel Gabriel. The highest and the best out of all God's angels is Jibreel, peace be upon him. Jibreel came to prophet when he was in that cave. He asked him to recite and read. Muhammad said, I don't know how to read. He said, no, go ahead and read. He said, I don't know what to read. He repeated it thrice, read. He said, Ma ana biqari. I do not know what to read. So the first, when he asked him read, he said, I don't know how to read. Then he repeated. Then Muhammad said to him, I do not know what to read. So now see. First, he said, I do not know how to read. When he squeezed him, he said, I do not know what to read. So there wasn't even what? A scripture. That's when Jibreel, Angel Gabriel, asked him to recite, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, recite in the name of thy Lord, the one who created. The one who created humans, meaning a man from a clock. Iqra, recite. Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq in the name of thy Lord who created. Iqra, again read. And your Lord is the most what? Noble. Five verses revealed unto Muhammad in the cave of Hira, chapter 96. Chapter 96, verse, verses 1 to 5 were the first verses of the glorious Quran. Before this, no verse, no scripture, no book was sent to Muhammad.
peace be upon them. So this verse is where you two, to be, like let's say someone asked you, what was the verse revealed unto Muhammad in the cave of Hira? These are the verses that you heard. So he received the verse and he ran. Because when the, when the angel came, the angel was so big, 600 wings. How many wings? How many? No, you got it right. How many? 600 wings. And we're not talking about the Chinese take away, you know, chicken wings from Chinese take away. That's not what we're talking about. Just even imagine now if Chinese take away, you know, you go to restaurant, they give you like 600 wings. Can you eat, that? Can you eat them all? You're just going to be pumped up. By the time you finish eating, maybe like 20, you can't even what? You can't even stand up. Your family will call you and say, you know, I'm done. Just wait. Let me digest some of my wings. But 600 wings of an angel is not like what we know today. So Muhammad was asked to recite. He did recite. He ran to his wife, Khadija, peace be upon her. She was the first wife of our Prophet, peace be upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah. She said to him, are you afraid? He said, yes, of course. He said, because the man that came to me, or the angel that came to me, do you want me to be closer here? It's all right. It's okay. You can move on. Yeah, I can be like George Brown if you want to be right here. It's all right. I can move around. You know, Bruce Lee, I have to keep on moving. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I, I have to make sure I'm keeping the flow, right? Unless you want to keep me hostage right here. Okay, so that was Muhammad and the first five verses. He went home, he started sleeping. Out of fear, he went straight to bed. The angel came back and asked him to stand up because the verses that he received from God, he should not go to sleep. The responsibility had what? Kicked in. Thank you very much, brother. May Allah reward you. They saw me sweating. You know, you can't get in the ring with Muhammad Ali without sweating. So this is what happened. He was sleeping. The angel came back and asked him to what? To wake up. The verses that you received, now is the time of promulgation. You have to call people to it. You have to announce to the world because the book that we gave you, you have to make sure that the world gets to what? To listen. And that's why the respected now Muslims that we have here in this room is the responsibility of Muslims to teach you what that scripture contains and what that book teaches and what that book is all about and also the message that the book contains. If Muslims fail to do it, it's your own responsibility to learn because that man, when he came with the book, he did not come with the book only for Muslims. Because when he stood up the second time when the angel came, the angel came to him with three to five verses of a surah or a chapter called Muddathir. The verse, Ya ayyuhal Muddathir. Oh, the one who had enveloped or covered himself in a blanket. No, this responsibility, you can go to sleep. You have to wake up and you have to teach. You have to let people know what that message is about. That's when he woke up. He started teaching. The first people that he called to, he called to that scripture or he called to that faith system, the first man to respond to his call was Abu Bakr. What was his name again? Abu Bakr was his first companion ever to believe. Among what? Men. But do you know the first person, period, to believe in him as a prophet? That was a female, his own wife. So see the sisters here, you see your role in, the, in, in this faith? People sometimes been, you know, get some things twisted that, you know, the, the, the Muslim sisters or the sisters in general, they, when it comes to faith, they're always in the back because they pray in the back, so they always have to be kept. Whosoever says that, you know, he, he needs to go to a hospital. Why? Because this message, the first to believe in, Muhammad was Khadija, his wife. 
peace be upon her. She started inviting people. When she started inviting people to the faith, they asked, what can Muhammad give the people? She started explaining. That's when he recited the verse 107. Now before I explain this verse, I would like to announce this to you. Quran consists of 114 chapters. How many chapters? 114 chapters. Each chapter is divided into a number of verses. And the verses are called ayat. The verses are called what? Ayat. So 114 chapters. And each chapter divided into ayat. Basically like segments. And the book from cover to cover contains 604 pages only. How many pages? 604. So the first chapter is called Fatiha, and Fatiha consists of seven verses. The second, or chapter number two, is Baqarah, and it contains 286. Chapter number three is called Al Imran, and it contains 200 verses. Chapter number four is Surah An Nisa, it consists of 476 verses. Chapter number five is Uqud, or Ma'ida, 120. Chapter number six is called An'am 165. Chapter number seven is A'raf 206. Chapter number eight is Amphal 75. Chapter number nine is Tawbah 129 verses. Chapter number 10 is Yunus 109 verses. Chapter number 11 is Hud with 123 verses. Chapter number 13 is Yusuf, 111 verses. Chapter number 12 is Surah al Ra'd, 100, um, is 43 verses. Okay, chapter number 13, Surah al Ra'd, or chapter number 14, Ibrahim, Muslims, how many verses? Y'all wanna Google it? <laughs> <laughs> So the verse is all the way to the end. We can go all the way to the last chapter, but you know, we don't want to run out of time, and we know we, you have some questions to ask. So 114 chapters, each chapter is divided into what? Verses, and the verses are called what? Uh, yeah. Now to the Muslims and non-Muslims here, whatever contradicts, whatever contradicts the 6,000, 236 verses of Quran. Quran all together from chapter 1 to chapter 114 contains 6,236 verses. How many verses? 6,000 what? Whatever contradicts those verses, even one. If a Muslim will do something against one verse out of these verses is not Islam. Our practice comes from where? From where? Quran. So whatever we do, if we contradict that scripture, it's not part of our faith. And that which explains that scripture or that book is the traditions and the sayings of that final prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What he did, what he said, what he approved, and what he disapproved in our science is called hadith. It's called what? Hadith. hadith. So hadith basically explains Quran. These are the two main sources of Islam. Whoever comes to you with something other than these two, he is just talking. It's not part of our faith. If you come up with something against the first scripture, the Quran, the final testament revealed unto Muhammad, and whatever contradicts the sayings and also the behavior of our prophet, whatever contradicts that, it's not part of what? Islam. It's not part of Islam. 
So our guest here, may God bless you all. Whatever you see, if media would say something, or somebody tells you that this, what Muhammad did, meaning regular Muhammad today, not the prophet, what Khadija is doing, or what Abdullah is doing, like let's say maybe in the university, a Muslim act cuckoo. You know acting cuckoo? Acting like cuckoo bird? If a Muslim acts cuckoo, that means it's upon him. It's not part of what? It's not part of our faith because it's not part of the first source. What is the first source again? Quran. And the second source? See, always going together like that. Like barbecue sauce, sweet and sour, just like that all the time. Louisiana hot sauce, all the time. Combining, bringing the combination. So whatever goes against Quran and Sunnah or Quran and Hadith, people here in this room announce to the world that it's not part of our faith. So today we would like to examine and learn about his behavior that changed the world permanently. One verse out of that 6,000 verses is verse 107 of chapter 21. This is chapter called Surah to Al-Anbiya. What's the name again? Surah to what? Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya is chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 107. Almighty says, illa rahmatan And we have not sent thee save to be a mercy to the world. A mercy to Muslims or to the world? Hello? The people in the back, mercy to Muslims or to the world? To the world. So his mercy is not only limited even to human beings, even animals. He was merciful to everybody who had, who had actually asked or went or sat or benefited from him. Mercy. He saw a camel. You know, in America, we don't have camels like that, but you know, during their time, camels like dope. Camels at that time, it's like, S550 2020, you know, S class Mercedes, right? Camels at that time is like double, like it's like double R Range Rover supercharged, just like Lamborghini at that time. Camels at that time, if you steal a camel from an Arab at that time, man, you're going to jail because that was the best, what that's the best form of wealth. At that time, our prophet, when I say our prophet, I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about that prophet sent to all of us. Because all of us in this room and all of us alive today, Muslims, non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sikhs, all of us, that man was sent to all of us, not only Muslims. Because we have more than seven verses in Quran that mention about his message not being directly or exclusively for Muslims. In chapter 2, verse 186, his message and the book given to him is for the whole world. In chapter 4, Surah Nisa, verse 105, we've revealed unto you the book in order for you to what? To call mankind and announce to the world. And in chapter 14, verse 1, Alif Lam Mara, this is a scripture from Almighty God to the whole world. And in chapter 14, verse 52, this is actually a final testament from God to warn people and mankind all together. And in chapter 18, verse 4, this book was revealed unto Muhammad, in order for Muhammad to warn those who had said that Prophet, that Almighty God had taken for himself what? A son. And in chapter 39, verse 41, Almighty God said, This book was given unto you, Muhammad, in order for you to announce to the world that they are also part of this message. So Muslims, this book is not our book, like sometimes we say this, our. It's for the world. So just like we, Muslims, must read the book, our guest here tonight, it's also your responsibility. If we 
as Muslims fail to announce to you or teach or invite you or pass on the books unto you to read? You know, if you, if you have Xfinity, you can just Google it. The Quran will pop up and read, see the information that Almighty God left in that scripture. So let's see part of his mercy. He saw a camel that was abandoned by the owner. And the camel is almost what? The camel near dying. Then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saw the camel. He asked, who is the owner of this camel? He said, I'm the owner, O Prophet, peace be upon you. He said, why you did not feed the camel? He said, you know, because I was busy. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told him, if you, don't show, if you don't show mercy to this animal, God Almighty will never show mercy unto you. And he saw a companion carrying a bird. He asked him, where you got this bird from? He said, I passed by this nest and I saw the bird. Did you know on the top, I just grabbed the bird. He said, where's the mother? He said, the mother, I left the mother over there. You know, I just want to grow them and just have fun. He said, you separated the bird from their mother. Whoever separates a bird from their mother, Almighty God will separate you and your loved ones on the day of judgment. He said, take the bird back to the mother. And there was a lady who was saved by a camel. She was captured by some pagans of Arabia. So when they went to sleep, she saw a camel and she just rode the camel and escaped. So when she came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he asked her, where did you get this from? She narrated the story. He said, I, I was captured by them. When they went to sleep, I saw the camel. I just took the camel. But I vowed and promised Almighty God that if I'm saved through this camel, what I will do to show my gratitude to Almighty God is that I will slaughter this camel. Prophet said, how evil you will be. Is this how to reciprocate and pay the animal? For you to be saved through this animal and what you will pay back is to slaughter the animal? This is not fair. Mercy to what? Even animal, not humans. Because all the non-Muslims around him and all the Muslims around him, they witness his mercy. And sometimes there will be an argument between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. The non-Muslim will say, you know what, let's go to Muhammad. The Muslim will say, uh-uh, I don't want to go there. You know why? You know why? Hello? You know why? Because the Muslim knows that if he does not have the right, our prophet does not care. He will give the right to the owner. So a Muslim will say, you know what, let's go somewhere else. And now a Muslim will say, uh-uh, let's go to Muhammad. All the non-Muslims, the pagans at the time, that denied his message, do you know the most trustworthy person among them? That was Muhammad, peace be upon him. They took him as Wachovia Bank. No, no, sorry. It's Wells Fargo now. You had, uh, no more Wachovia, right? Okay. You know, Fargo will go, or Wells will go far, so it's Wells Fargo. <laughs> See? So he was like Wells Fargo to them. They have wealth. They have, in, like, expensive Jews, nowhere to store. They used to take everything to Muhammad to take care of it. They were seeking to kill him, but he was the one holding their what? Their wealth. And none of them even questioned. You know what? We show him enmity. He may eat our money. All of them trusted that he will keep it for them because he was number one, trustworthy among them all. And the day that they sought to kill him, he said to his own cousin Ali, he said to Ali, do you know what? This man is seeking to kill me. This man is seeking to kill me, but he has his own items in my house. I want you to take it and give it back to them and tell them Muhammad is going to Medina so that they will not be deprived of their own properties. Who will do this today? Even you slap me and I get your dollars? Man, I'm gone. But the, that prophet wasn't like that. 
Even you give him the best, he will give it back to you. See, so today, if you give like, let's say, even peanut butter jelly to Muslim, not Benjamin, just peanut butter jelly, he may not give it back to you if you disturb him. But does that, make, does that make this act to be part of our faith? No. Because the example is Muhammad, peace be upon him. And now see his justice. He was sitting when a man called Ghaziya, one of the companions called Ghaziya, you know, accidentally he stepped on, the, on his foot. Ghaziya was passing by Muhammad, peace be upon him. Accidentally, Ghaziya did not see. He stepped on the foot of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt it. So as he was, he was always, you know, carrying his own, um, you know, stick. As Ghaziya passing by, when he stepped on Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet was raising up his own stick. It just touched Ghaziya on his stomach. So he felt the pain. You know, sometimes if you move really quickly, just like maybe Yip Man or Van Damme with his legs, you move real quick sometimes before you realize you already kicked somebody. So he did not intend to kick Ghaziya with that. So when Ghaziya stepped on his foot, he was just trying to stand up. So he tapped what? Ghaziya with his cane. Ghaziya said, oh, Muhammad, you know, stroke me with your cane. He said, no, I didn't mean it. But the Ghaziya went home. He said, early in the morning, somebody came and started to, he started calling my name. Where is Ghaziya? I said, oh, oh. I stepped on him last night. Maybe he's, he's about to give me maybe some mountain block or something. But when he came, Prophet gave him 100 camels. He said, as a result of tapping you with that stake accidentally so that I can pay off. This man, do you think he will promote terrorism? I respected now Muslims here. Do you think this man will promote terrorism? Do you think so? Huh? Do you think so? He said, I cannot even go to sleep if I disturb one person because God Almighty will call me to what? Accountability on the day of judgment. I can't go to sleep. If, you, if I have a dime that belongs to somebody else, I have to give it back before I go to sleep or make sure that if I'm dead, somebody among my family can take it back to the owner because I know I will answer to Almighty. This type of behavior and this type of, you know, decorous manners is what changed his own enemies. Do you know? Number one enemy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the number one enemy. What can you think of? Huh? Who? Abu Jahl? See, this man Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl, if trouble, the word trouble, if trouble is like solar system, Abu Jahl will be the sun. He is so troublemaker that he does not even, he can't stand to see prophet or hear about it. One day, he came out. He saw Muhammad making sujood. Sujood is, you know, when he prostrate in prayer. So he prostrated in prayer. When he prostrated in prayer, Abu Jahl said, I will step on his neck so that he cannot even get up to talk again. When he get closer to the neck of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, man, he backed off, he started running. The non-believers asked him, hey, Abu Jahl, you promised us last night that if, if Muhammad goes to sujood or prostrate, you will step on his neck. And we saw you going to him, but when he got close, you started running. He said, uh-uh, I saw some that y'all did not even see. His neck turned like a fire. This man must be protected by God or somebody must be somewhere taking care of him, but we cannot see. So, a man came to him called Ahnaf ibn Qais. He strangled Abu Jahl. He said, come on, tell me. It's between us now. Do you believe in Muhammad? Ahnaf ibn Qais, he's another non-believer. Another what? Pagan in Arabia. He strangled Abu Jahl. He said to Abu Jahl, tell me, 
A Muhammad Sadiqun Am Kadhib. Muhammad, is he trustworthy or blameworthy? Is he telling the truth or is just lying? Do you know what Abu Jahl said? He said, come on, man, why are you asking me Muhammad is uh, trustworthy or not? We all know that ain't nobody like Muhammad, you know, but keep this between us. Don't let nobody know. So all of them, they knew who that man was. Behavior-wise, nobody like him. Patience-wise, nobody like him. They persecuted his own companions. They sought to frustrate his own community. They kicked him out of his own city. They sought to kill him, but they did not succeed. But when he returned back to Medina, where he passed away, he came back again to Mecca when he opened the place for his own companions to practice the faith. The non-believers and the pagans of Mecca were captured. So all of them came as captives right in front of him. So he asked them, what do you think I will do with you today? What do you think? Do you know what they said? They say, Akhun Karim wabnu Akhun Karim. We know you are a noble man, the son of a noble man. If you kill us, we deserve to be killed. But if you, if you forgive, we know that Muhammad is known as what? Forgiver. He said, okay, all of you go, you're free. When they left, some of them came back and then they announced their own shahada. Shahada is when you want to be a Muslim, the word that you say is called shahada. The words that you pronounce is called what? Shahada. And this shahada makes an individual a Muslim. So they came and they pronounced their shahada. So Mama ibn Uthal was one of the chieftains of Yemen. He killed a representative of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad sent to Yemen, the country Yemen that we know today. The Prophet sent one of his followers over there to teach and call them to faith. When he arrived, this leader, he chopped his neck and he killed him. He chopped his neck and he killed him. The news reached Prophet, and by, by the way, when it comes to Arabs custom, you cannot kill someone who is sent to you as a representative of somebody else. It's against their custom and culture to kill. But this man, he did kill him. So all the Arabs were angry. Not only Muhammad, even the pagans were angry because he broke what? The protocol. Not long ago, Thumama, the one who killed that representative, was captured. He was brought to Muhammad when Muhammad was in the masjid. The masjid is a place where we pray. Thumama was brought in the masjid. The prophet asked him to be tied. They said, you know what? Just tie his hand, his hand against this wall. So he was tied up against the wall. The companions thought that Muhammad will what? Will kill him. He asked the companions, you know, just get him some food, let him eat. The companions was like, oh, hold on, Muhammad, he is the killer. He said, yes, I know he the killer, just feed him. Just feed who? Thumam. Umar said, you know, Umar was tough. He was a tough man, one of his followers. Umar said, well, he is the killer. He killed the one that you sent to Yemen. He said, I know, just feed him. They fed Thumama ibn Uthal for three days. How many days? He get breakfast, better than the one from, from Dunkin' Donuts. He get lunch, better than the one from Pizza Hut. And he get dinner, better than Chinese takeaway. How many days? Three days. Come on, man, even if I was with Thumama, I would say I prefer to stay here. Captured, but he's still been what? Fed. So Muhammad asked him, you know, he said, just untie him, let him go. So they released to Mama. So Mama is still standing. I guess he, he wants some more meals. Go. He said, I'm not going. I want to have a word with you. He said, okay, go ahead. He said, why you did not kill me and I'm the one who killed your representative? Why you let me stay for three days and still feeding me? He said, because this is what the scripture gave me 
and what Almighty God gave me as part of my message is that I'm supposed to be mercy to even the weak and wicked people. Do you know what happened? Sumama left. Three hours later, he came back. He said, I want to be one of the followers, and I want to be your companion. Then Prophet Muhammad asked him, why you did not accept the shahada, if you remember the word? Why you did not become a Muslim at that time when you were tied up? He said, no, I didn't want to accept it at that time because if I do, your companions will think like I did it out of what? Fear. And I wanted it to be from my heart for you to know that I'm truthful in what I'm saying. So we will pause right here and take some lessons. All of us here, the Muslims and the non-Muslims, this is how he dealt with his companions. But when we say the followers or disciples of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of them, from Abu Bakr, because the top ten, he had the best. You see in America, in the Constitution, the checks and balances that we have, separation of power. Do you know where we, we got this from? This is from his companions. They set it up. The idea of checks and balances came from them. He had his ten top. Companions, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, Talha, Saad, Saeed, Ibn Auf, and Amir. They were the top ten companions. All of them, all of them, not even one that was born a Muslim. All of them embrace Islam. And all the top companions, all of them all together, without exception, all of them embrace Islam. But guess what? They were the worst before Islam. And afterwards, they became the best. They, used, they, they sought corruption in Arabia. Like one of them, Umar, they said a woman, you know, got miscarriage when she saw Umar coming because he was like, he like tiger. You know, when you see a tiger coming to you, what what you going to do? Well, you say, I get, I get extra piety, you know. You know, God will save me or Jesus will serve me or you just going to jump. Hey, if we see tiger right here, I will create even a window right here to be out. I know you're going to block this door, so I have to create my own. Nobody will stay right here if we see tiger. You're going to stay out? All of us will run. They said, Omar... When he comes out, he, he like tiger to some. But guess what? When he became Muslim, he was the most humble after Abu Bakr out of all of them. Some of them were killers, murderers. After Islam, they became the best. So what we are announcing here is a man who embraces Islam and does not become the best that means something is wrong with what he is practicing. It's not doing it the way Prophet Muhammad left it as a legacy for the world. So all of them, they used to drink, they used to fornicate, they used to steal, they used to rob, they used to kill, all kinds of evils. They did everything. But when Muhammad came to them with this message, they changed. And we can say this, you know, confidently. You know, I grew up in Philly. In Philly, I, he was born in Philly. You know how Philly is. Even the pious person, yeah, you know, he, he get gun, cock and lock all the time. <laughs> right? In, in, in Philly, you can ask a person to give you a, a cigarette. He will say, I don't have it. Give me a gun. He say, here. Some people that were... In jail for years. You know how Philly is, huh? Some of them you cannot even talk to them. The mafia. Now you go to Sister Claire Muhammad. The biggest mosque in Philly is called Sister Claire Muhammad. You go to Sister Claire Muhammad Sheikh. The old mafias, they all repented. And they brought peace in the same community. <laughs> we asked them, why are you so peaceful? 
They say because we corrupted this place when we were in the, the state of ignorance. And now that we discover this faith and how the Islamic faith makes an individual um, you know, humble, that's why we have to bring about what? Change. And a lot of them like that. Okay, in our, in our mosque, while we pray every Friday, 95% of the people that come in, some of them served 20 years. Some of them 30. Some of them even 50 just came out. One of them just came out. How many people he killed? He said, I'm even embarrassed to tell you the amount of people that I killed. But he said, when I, when I embraced the faith and I started learning about Muhammad, my life changed. So to all the non-Muslims here, being proud to be with you here tonight, so here in San Diego, it's not the place of Maradona Diego. It's a spot where all of us have to come together. See, Muslims and non-Muslims, I would like to mention this before we close. When Jesus was alive, did the whole world embrace Christianity? I'm asking. When Jesus was alive, the whole world embraced Christianity, his faith. Okay. When Moses was alive, the whole world embraced Judaism? Huh? When Prophet Muhammad was alive, did the whole world become Muslim? No. So that means there will never be a time that the whole world will be Christianized or the whole world will be only Jews or the whole world will be only Muslims. That had never happened and that will never happen. So the only thing we have to determine is how to come together. When it comes to our faith, it's something that we made our own decision to follow. But when it comes to the betterment of our own land, do we have to fight? Or we have to come together to secure what the preamble had mentioned. So as, as a Muslim, I should not just look at a Christian or a Jew or a Sikh that since you're not a Muslim like me, you know, when I see you, I just frown, you know, just like cheetah or leopard coming. No. And as a Christian, don't look at a Muslim because maybe CNN said something or BBC said something or Al Jazeera said that Muslims are the you know, troublemakers. You know, because today, even if a Muslim says the word algorithm, they say he promoting terrorism. That's our media. When we won the Super Bowl in Philly, Philadelphia is only 1. what? 1.5 million. All together. But do you know how many people came to Philadelphia just to celebrate the victory of, you know, Philadelphia team? Do you know how many? Philadelphia, the population is one point what? Five million. Do you know when they won the Super Bowl, the amount of people that came? Three million came to Philly. Just to what? Just to what? Hello? Celebrate. Just to celebrate the, you know, the victory. Because for how many years they didn't win? You know, how, how long? First time ever. Huh? Not the first time. You know, we did it before, Sheikh. <laughs> Come on, Sheikh. We did it before. <laughs> decades and decades, Philadelphia did not win. So when Philadelphia won, three million people came just to celebrate. Guess what? Among the three million, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Jews, we have Sikhs, we have Buddhists, we have Yeezim, we have Shiism, we have Ayis. Everybody came just to celebrate. So if Super Bowl can unite people and put aside the faith, now when it comes to the growth and ascendancy and betterment of our land, we can come together? Hello, we can? We can do it? See Media is what is separating us. Media is what is putting in your mind that Muslims are th like this or that. Or Muslims, we're thinking about, you know, the other faiths, like, you know what, if, if they're not Muslims, you know, you know, to hell with all. That's media doing this. That's not from faith. Jesus did not promote it. That wasn't the message of Jesus Christ. That wasn't the message of Moses 
and that wasn't the message of Muhammad. All of them, the three of them, they were brothers. Do you know what Prophet Muhammad, do you know what he said about Jesus? He said, Jesus and I, we like this. Jesus and I, we like what? We like what? Like this. The only distinction, the only difference is that he came what? He came before. And I'm the last and the seal of all prophets. We have this in Hadith. So if Prophet Muhammad had said about his brother or about Jesus that they're brothers like this. That's the same thing that chapter 5 verse 82 of Quran. If y'all can write this down, please just search it later on. Chapter 5 verse 82. It says that the closest one to Muslims and those who can really be together and be really close in terms of even when it comes to faith and also collaboration, Muslims and what? And Christians. So we can make it, we can make America what? Great again. It's not only, you know, Mr. Trump. It's not only the president talking about making America great again. No, it's our responsibility to make our land what? Huh? To make it what? Is he the only one living in it to make it greater? We're all in it. Benefiting from the Constitution. Benefiting from its own resources. So we have to make sure that socially we are also what? Responsible. See, sometimes from even third grade, we start learning about social responsibility. But when we grow older, we even forget. Prophet Muhammad was sitting, peace be upon him, he was sitting by himself. His companions around, they heard a very terrible sound. And they just jumped. It sounded like boom. It's like someone threw a bomb somewhere. So when they heard that sound, all the companions, the young, the old, you know, men, women, everybody gets scared. Do you know what happened? They all jumped. To respond to see okay what was the origin of that sound what's going on when they rushed to respond to see what was the problem prophet was already coming from where they heard the, vo um, the voice he was tightening his belt he said don't worry it's already taken care of what do you understand from this they were trying to what address and respond to the sound maybe something going on or there's a problem so as they were rushing to it they saw him what? Coming, tightening and fixing his belt. That means the problem is already what? Solved. So as a Muslim, it's your responsibility to take care of your own place, your own city, your own community. You have to give service. That's the teaching of that man. That before even people respond, you already what? Just like Black thought, you know, the boy in Philly. He said, you know, I thought you the first to ride, but you're still sleeping. So we have to be what? Socially what? That's what he left behind as a legacy. So before his companions are even up, he's already up. So this is what we wanted to share with you. You know, you can talk till like Sunday. Tomorrow is what? Friday, right? If you want, we can keep on going, just, you know, talking till Sunday. But you know that's not fair because y'all need to feed, you know, we need to feed our stomach, you know, get some energy. You see? So this man, Muhammad, a person will say, well, if that was who this man was, and that was Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, not Muhammad Ali, not the original Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim, the son of Abdul Manaf, the son of Qusay, the son of Kilab, the son of Murrah, the son of Nizar, the son of Mudrika, the son of Ilyas, the son of Ma'ad, the son of Adnan. If that was this man who came with a message and his legacy was preserved and the whole world get to listen to it, why is it that his followers today, you know, wherever you go and they get group of Muslims always like trouble and always like problems and always like this and Muslims don't seem to come together and even when now Muslims look at Muslims they like, like they're troublemakers do you know why? It's because Muslims themselves they have distanced themselves from this man 
everybody doing his own thing. Everybody building his own organization. Everybody building his own, you know, spot. Everybody trying to ring his own bell. Everybody building, you know, Taco Bell, you know, just come to Taco Bell. You know, if Wendy's don't go to, just like, see, you know the commercial that they, um, and they have the, um, the cows, you know, the cow riding, eat only chickens? You know that one? You think they love chickens, right? No, they're telling you eat chickens so that you can leave them alone. <laughs> right? You see? So everybody's just calling to, to his own thing. So to our respected non-Muslims here today in this um, blessed university, in case you see Muslims don't seem to be together, or whenever media talk about Islam or talk about Muslims, you know, it's just like always problems, always. No. The one that you're supposed to look at is, as our example is not us. It's the leader himself. Because if we imitate and follow him closely, the same thing he exhibited, we will be able to do it today. So the scripture teaches us in chapter 33, verse 21, that indeed you have the best example in the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all the non-Muslims that came here, and those who will be listening, you know, um, later on, we want to announce that that man, Muslims, can be in trouble from time to time, but Islam will never be in trouble. Muslims can mess up sometimes, but Islam will never what? Will never. So this is what we wanted to share with you tonight. And this is what we came here with tonight. And this is only like a drop of the ocean, of his legacy that we shared with you tonight. I hope and pray that you learn something from this man and what he offered to the world. And his companions, when he left them, they did not sit. The same thing that he did, they carried to the next level. And they started traveling from country to country. When Muslims arrived in Spain, Muslims ruled Spain for more than 762 years. That's when the Europeans, all of them, love Islam. But you go to, to Europe today, you know, you don't see people mentioning Islam like that because Muslims came and they messed up things that the predecessors left. So if we want to return back to that power that Almighty gave those people, see, all the time, we keep on talking about, you know, this group, that group, this color, that color. You know, there is no such, some, some, like Dave Chappelle will tell you some, you know, you know, always, you know, just black power. And someone will come, white power. Man, ain't no power. If you bring the white and the black together, you get the best what? The best writing. Now, if you write here with white, will you see it? Huh? You have a white, like, let's say, white uh, um, ink. And you write it here. Will you see it? How about if you drop, you know, um, black on it? Will you see it or not? So together they what? Together they what? They shine. You see? And all the time, and that's why the prophet said about neighborhood. About what? Neighborhood. You know, nothing in the, in the, in the hood but good, right? And nothing in the hood but good. See? So he said about our neighborhood that as a person, you have to be part of the success of your own neighbor. And before he passed away, he warned his companions. He said, I'm leaving you with two things. Never disrespect these two. And never you, you know, even extend your hands to disturb them. The first that he talked about was woman. He said, never disrespect them and never even put your hands on women. I know the woman here, you would like that one, right? See, sometimes, you know, the, you see a man in New York, a man in New York, he locked the door and he started doing some push-ups. Hey, what you doing? He said, I'm about to knock my wife. I said, come on, man, you crazy. Just doing push-ups so he can build some muscle just to knock. And some people, you know, with their wives in the house, they did like, you know, even the Holyfield and Mike Tyson in 96, where somebody will lose piece of his ear. No. Before his death, peace be upon him, he said, do not what? Stretch out your hands to even what? 
harm women. And he also said, the next is your neighbors. Your what? Your neighbors. Whether they are Muslims or not. And he kept on repeating. And Jibreel kept on telling Muhammad, peace be upon him, that announce to your, to your community, tell your followers that they should be what? Respectful of the two. Respect women and respect what? Your neighbors. He kept on repeating. Prophet ﷺ said, I even thought that he would say that, you know what, they even have rights in your properties after your death, that you now family. That's what he left behind, so that all of us can be together peacefully. Because he lived with Muslims, just like the way he lived with non-Muslims, and he created that peaceful environment, and all of them prosper. So either to be in the same faith, if not, at least there's mutual respect and regard so that we can move together as one community. Because if, if we are neighbors and your house caught a fire, you know, before the firefighters arrive, who will see it first? Who will see it first? Sometimes you may not even be able to make a phone call, maybe do it to the inferno that you're going through or the conflagration that you're seeing. You may not be able to even make a call. Who will make that phone call on your behalf? Neighbor. Neighbors. So neighborhood and your neighbors, that's what he left as final message to the world. Women and neighbors. He came to an environment where women used to be what? Like baby girls used to be what? Buried alive. He came and canceled all that. In America here, even all the way to the time of um, the 28th president of our nation. Who was that 28th president? Lincoln, who was the 28th? Y'all still in school, so I know y'all get sharp, you know. Who was the 28th president? Not Thomas Jefferson, he was the third. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said, if you want to make enemies, try to change something. If you want to make enemies, try to what? Because during the um, Great Depression and the problems that he went through, before you can change something, or before you can cause even um, prosperity to be envisioned by people, some people will not like you. So when it comes to building together, we have to make sure that we stick together. If our neighbors cannot envision it, individuals can do it. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, he said, one man with the courage is community. One person with courage is what? So if your community cannot see it, and you can see it, bring it out. And our second president, the President John Adams from uh, you know, uh, Massachusetts, he made it clear. If people were people to act like angels, there's no government necessary. So sometimes people will act up, but it's our responsibility to what? To fix, not to bring problems. So finally, Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent to the world not only to Muslims, the one who changed the world permanently for good, whether people accept it or not, that was that man, Muhammad, son of Abdullah. And as a president of this nation, or a governor serving a um, state, one of the states of you know, um, this union, or serving um, a city, all together must know the service that he rendered. If you do not accept or embrace his faith, at least give him credit for what he had done for humanity before all of us got here. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. May God Almighty bless you.